Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. Welcome to Module 5 of Week 2. And as you may recall, what we have been doing the first four modules is trying to get these set of equations, the NEGF equations. And as I said, the main equations are these one and two, this non-equilibrium Green's function equations. And then when you want to interpret this, this density of states or the current, that's what three and four is about. Now, one thing I should mention is before I move on, as I said, what I want to do after this is ap apply these equations to different kinds of problems. So you get a physical feeling for the different things involved and how to apply them. But before I move on, let me just obtain another expression for the current. You know, the, this is the expression we discussed in the last module. And what I'll do is obtain a slightly different form, which is often useful. Now, the reason I didn't list it in the basic set of equations is that it's not completely general. It doesn't always work. Whereas these equations you never have to revisit. This is it. So the reason I mentioned that is there are problems where people want to include some amount of interactions with the surroundings. You see, this is this elastic resistor where electrons are going straight from contact one to contact two. That's what we have been analyzing so far. But you could also analyze channels where there is some interaction with the surroundings described by some sigma zero. Now, if you did that, what would happen is, if you had things like that, you'd have to add a sigma zero here. There would be an additional term. This would be your regular contacts, and this would be that additional thing. And then there would be an additional term here. But none of these equations would change. So in other words, as long as the sigma was defined to include the additional sigma, the sigma n was defined to include the additional thing, everything here would be fine. On the other hand, the particular expression for current we'll now be obtaining, that one though would need modification if, if that were the case, which is why I didn't quite want to include it in the basic list of equations. Okay? But then lots of problems that we'll be talking about, in fact most of the problems we'll be talking about, do not really involve this additional thing in it. It's where electrons go straight through. That's what technically you'd call coherent transport, goes right through. Okay? In that case, I drop that and I drop that, none of that. And so, in that case you can actually obtain a slightly simpler expression. So let's say we have this two terminal device like we are talking about, and we want the current in contact one. Okay, so here also I should put one, one, one. Okay, so what I want to do is play around with this term within the parenthesis a little bit to simplify it, and it will work something like this. So look at that first term, it's, I guess I could, since gamma one is involved in both, I could pull it out of this whole thing and write it inside. So you take the gamma one out and come back to that. So what I'm looking at what is what's inside. So here you have A, and A, as you may recall, we had this expression for A, GR gamma GA. So I can use that. So I could write A as GR and gamma is the sum of gamma 1 plus gamma 2 and then GA. So that's the A. And this is then multiplied by that number F1. And then you have GN which is, as you may recall, is GR sigma in GA and the sigma in has a gamma 1 f1 and a gamma 2 f2. So you could write it as gr gamma 1 f1 plus gamma 2 f2. Just so there is no confusion, let me erase this. 
，但不是这个。Okay, now if you look here, you see you have this first term is gr gamma one ga with a f one here. Similarly, this is also gr gamma one ga. With an F1. Now, F1 is of course just a number. It's a Fermi function in contact one. So it's not a matrix. So I don't really need to have it here. I could always pull it out, put it somewhere else in that thing. So the point is that that term will exactly cancel that term. Now, if you look at the second one, this is GR gamma 2 GA. This is also GR gamma 2 GA, but here it's multiplied by F1 and here it's multiplied by F2. And so they don't cancel. So overall then, you could write this as, you know, this part as gr gamma 2 ga multiplied by f1 minus f2. Okay. So what we did was sort of just played around with this part, af1 minus gn. And remember, the way we think about this is, this is like the electron density inside the channel, this is kind of what it should be if it was in equilibrium with contact one. And if there's a difference, there'll be a current flow. That's the idea. So if I take this quantity and put it back in there then, instead of this, I'll put in what we just obtained. And then there's the F1, F2, F1 minus F2. Right, that is the black one. That's it. So this is the different form that I was talking about. So you have the current as given by trace of this quantity times F1 minus F2, Q over H. And again, it's not a new result. What we did was took our basic current equation from here and did some algebra using the relations appropriate for a coherent two-terminal device. Now, one point I should stress here is that this is current per unit energy because we are just writing the current at a given energy, at a fixed energy level. And as I've mentioned before, with this elastic resistor, the, what makes this whole thing relatively simple to think about is that electrons at a given energy don't change energy as they go across the device. And so you can calculate the current at a given energy and then simply integrate over all energies to get the total current. So without this integral, this would be current per unit energy at a given energy. If you integrate over energy, that's how you'd get the full thing, see? So this is what you may compare to the general expression that was obtained in part one of this course. And if you have not taken part one, you can look back at in the notes, I believe this is like chapter three, I mean, which is, I guess they're labeled as lectures. So you'd be looking at lecture three called the elastic resistor, where what we had obtained was a general expression for current, see, which looked like one over Q integral dE G of E times F1 minus F2. And we called this the conductance function, see? Yeah. And of course, the key point about the elastic resistor was the fact that current depends on F1 minus F2. That only reason current flows is because the two contacts have two different Fermi functions, two different agendas. That's how you obtain this expression. So if you compare the two, you see what it is telling you then is that we now have an expression for this conductance function. So in part one of this course or in the in those early lectures, what we had done was we had used various semi-classical arguments to write down this conductance function. In fact, the expression we had, I believe was something like Q squared D over 2T where D was the density of states and T was the transfer time. So these were semi-classical arguments. What we have now obtained, you could say, is a quantum expression for it. For quantum coherent transport, this is the conductance function, you see? And we could write that here. So our conductance expression then 
is g of e is equal to you see g divided by q is equal to q over h times that. So you see that quantity is like g e over q. So actually I don't need to write it here, I could just write it up there that g over q is that. So if I just want to write g of e, it would be equal to q squared over h times that quantity. That's it. So this, uh, I guess we don't need the f1 minus f2 because that's separately taken care of. So this basically tells you then the conductance at a given energy is obtained from here. This is then the quantum expression that we can use in this context. Now, so if you were to ap apply this, for example, to a one-dimensional problem, that's what we'd like to do in the, you know, in the next module. We'll talk more about how to apply this to a one-dimensional, simple one-dimensional problem. What we need is, again, for to use the NEGF method in general, input is you need a H and you need the sigmas. So H, how do we write it? Well, for 1D, we have a simple model that we discussed back in week one. It is a matrix whose diagonal elements look like epsilon and the connection to the nearest neighbors is given by T. So if we actually wrote out the matrix, it would have looked like epsilon, epsilon, epsilon down the diagonal and T's on the upper diagonal and T's on the lower diagonal. That's what it should look like. So that we have discussed in week one. What we'll have to talk about a little more is how you write the sigma 1 and how you write the sigma 2. But once you have those, though, you should be able to calculate the conductance function straight from here. It would be q squared over h times trace of that quantity. And what's gamma 1 and gamma 2? Well, those are obtained from the sigmas using this relation. Gamma 1 is i, sigma 1 minus sigma 1 dagger. Gamma 2 is i, sigma 2 minus sigma 2 dagger. So those are the gammas. And how do you obtain the gr and the ga? Well, they are not separate things, as I mentioned. This is actually the conjugate transpose of that. So if we have this, we have that. And the way you obtain the retarded Green's function, the gr, is from here. It's a, you have h, you have sigmas, just invert that matrix. So that would be the straightforward matrix algebra then, once you have written this down. And what you'd find is, for example, if we apply it to this problem, what you'd find is that, I guess we had discussed earlier, that in this 1D case, you have this EK relation, which looks something like this. Right? E is equal to epsilon plus 2t cosine ka. See, back in week one, we talked about how you can obtain these dispersion relations, which give you the energy eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian. And, of course, the way I've drawn it, that corresponds to a negative t. Because, you see, when k is equal to zero, this is epsilon plus 2t which if t is negative, that would be the lowest point. If t were positive, it would be turned the other way. So usually t is negative, but you draw it this way. So what that means is you have energy eigenvalues in this energy range, you know, from epsilon plus 2t to epsilon minus 2t. So epsilon plus 2t, that's the value at k equal to zero. Epsilon minus 2t, that's the value when Ka is equal to pi. So those would be, that's the dispersion relation we had obtained. Now if you now use the method we talked about here, you'd get something like this. So this is energy and we'll calculate that quantity. That's what we'll do in the next module. I'm just trying to kind of set the stage for it, so we'll do that in the next module. But supposing we calculate this quantity what you would obtain is something like this. Within this band, that quantity will be equal to 1. So this quantity, which actually often is called the transmission, 
So it's sometimes called the transmission as a function of energy. That's a dimensionless number. Gamma have the dimensions of energy, that's per unit energy. So in a multiply, this is actually dimensionless. So that quantity transmission, it will be equal to one inside the band, zero outside the band. And so the way you would interpret it is, if you are talking about an energy that is inside this band of allowed energies, then the transmission is one so that the conductance is Q square over H, this quantized conductance gain that we talked about in part one of this course, but if you haven't taken it or do not remember it, you should look at lectures four and five of the World Scientific Notes. So within this band, it's Q square over H. Outside this band, it's zero, no conduction at all. But the important thing is, now this quantized conductance comes automatically out of it. So back in the, those early lectures, I mean, in the part one of this course, I had to argue that heuristically about why it may be quantized. But here, of course, we now have a method that takes into account the wave nature of electrons. And so the quantized conductance comes automatically out of it. You get this Q square over H. So this is, so we'll start then in the next module with this 1D example. I'll explain how you write the sigmas for this problem, for this 1D problem, so that you would get a result like this. And what you'd also see is that if we had a impurity in this system, so that right around here, there happens to be something that gives it a different potential. You know, something, in st this is a uniform wire. Let's say at this point, it's something different, which means it is as if you had add a epsilon plus u, some potential here. Then you'll find you do not have this quantized conductance anymore. It's no longer a ballistic wire. Because of that potential, electrons get scattered, and what you'd find then is this does something more like this. I'm sorry, I guess we'll just focus on the lower part here. Let's see, to do something like this. I think if you calculated the whole thing, it would probably come back this way. So we'll focus on this part, the lower part, and we'll see what determines this you know, it is reduced compared to the ballistic conductor, and depending on the strength of the potential, this could be, you know, very small or not so small. Those things we'll be discussing in the next module.